welcome all of you. It makes it's always a pleasure to see all of you. It is wonderful on this fantastic day that you've chosen to spend all inside of us. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am to be able to introduce you to Peter, my brother in arm. And we've worked together for many years. Peter, I think, has the extraordinary ability of bridging many different fields. Not only is he a world class double bass player, jazz composer, um, his latest album, I would strongly recommend listening to that on, on, uh, on, uh, on Spotify. He's basically reimagining the songs of Paul Simon as a jazz. Um, and it's also perfectly fair because not only is Peter a world class jazz musician, he's also had two songs. He has a cousin and, and, uh, two, and two cousins. Two cousins, like, and, and all of them become five times push. So, But that's just the music. What he's going to talk to us about. Today is about music in the brain, which is one of those, I think, highly eudaimonic topics. Can you think of any other thing that is both a pleasure in the sense that chocolate is a pleasure, but also meaningful in the way that meditation can be? I can think of very few other things. And so, therefore, I felt, you know, for a sense of like eudaimonia and human flourishing, I think we already had a wonderful exposition from Milton who told us about music in general. But I thought it would also be nice to have a, a sort of a different kind of view, more into the brain. And of course, has spoken a lot about what is happening in the brain. What I'm hoping that you will hear and what you will enjoy today is to try to think about what is it that makes us move? What is groove? And just one final thing, though, you, you recognize some of the people who are dancing below, probably not the kids, but at least the guy over in the, in the two corners. And, and one of them, um, who's sadly no longer with us, Prince. Um, just to sort of attest to the kind of power of Peter's musicianship, it so turns out that Peter, in fact, trained the main bass the main, the main base with the Prince. And so I'm not sure whether he's going to tell us any insights. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but maybe we should stick with the science. Please, Peter. Yes. Thank you. 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 No murders today, though. Uh, there's most of what we know Oxford from, of course, in Denmark, all the murders being done, uh, according to all the series. But you can watch some television series. So, so, uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the stuff that Morgan and I have been working on for many years. We're doing this at the Centre for Music and Brain. And just to tell you very briefly who I am, uh, I'm a professor at the World Academy of Music, and I'm a main bass player and composer. I play double bass. I've been doing this for most of my life, of course. I mean, as I said, training at Small Centre, training a lot of uh, different bass players. But I also have uh, my master's in mathematics from Orange University and a bachelor's degree in French, and a bachelor's degree in music, and my PhD in neuroscience. So that's why I'm director of the Center for Music and Brain. What I do in the daytime, then I play at night. So, uh, so that's basically how that, that came about. We are at the moment a little bit more than 30 employees in the Center for Music and the Brain, mostly PhD students and postdocs and uh, uh, some professors that you will see here, of, uh, who, uh, of which you recognized Peter, Peter and Morgan here, but also the other Peter, as they say. Peter Keller, who joined the uh, lab uh, 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 half a year ago, and Eddie Obasco, who has been also founding this uh, sensor for music and brain. And the idea behind the sensor is actually pretty simple. That is that music is about addiction, and so is the brain. So, uh, so what I'm going to talk about is predicting process in music. I'm going to talk about how you can measure it using brain uh, methods. I'm going to talk about groove and a little bit about color rhythms and coordinated movements because I also wanted some completely new stories here that you will be the, some of the first to see. And uh, if I get to, I have a ton, a ton of slides, so I'll look at your faces and see, okay, now, now it, it is enough. But just to tell you uh, uh, how I uh, look at music. And just, uh, I would like to do this, I always do this in my lectures, but uh, I would like you to do a simple thing in music. You're going to clap 
what is known as three against four. And that means that half of the orange that would be here it is going to uh, clap a four four meter, and the other uh, half is going to clap three four meter. The now has tried it before. I don't know if you have succeeded, but uh, we'll try to make it do it. So if you sit a little bit up in your chair, so that it's we actually get this to sound nice. I'll get back to why afterwards. So I'll be talking to uh, you with this, and uh, as I go off, and then you just continue, and then we put the others in. Okay? One, two, three. Easy now, easy now. So the idea is here that half of the audience is in a march, four four meter, and the other half in a waltz. So the idea was it was supposed to be sound like this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So the idea is that what's happening in my fingers, so what will be acoustic input to your ears, that's always the same. One. But whether I count it off as a 4 4 meter or a 3 4 meter, it sounds completely different to our brains. So I should listen to how it changes uh, the sound when I go from 4 to 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. One, two, three, and here it's like it, it switches. And this is amazing because it's the same thing that's happening in the brain. So the idea here is that your music is nothing in itself. It becomes something when it meets the brain. But the brain has an idea of what it's going to listen to. So if it thinks it's smart, it'll be hearing in a different way. And if you think about it, what is a 4-4 four, four meter? It's actually a way to predict the future. So, so it's one, two, three, four. Strong, weak, strong. It sort of keeps on going, right? So it's a way to predict what is the strength of the next beat or the accentuation. So it's like a framework to understand what the auditory input is. But 3-4 is a completely different thing. It goes like this. One, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, strong, weak, weak, strong, weak. So, that means that your predictive model, the way you predict the future, determines how you listen, how you hear. And the interesting part is that it's that, that's why I start out with the 4 4 meter over here. Because if you come from our part of the world or the western part of the world, most, most people hear you know, everybody that is here. So, but when here as a three four meter, that's something the subdivisions that that's a long story. I don't want to here. But if you come from Ghana, for instance, it would be more natural to hear it as a four four meter. We can't hear it as a four four meter unless we've been training, like I obviously have, uh, to do this. So that means that two people can have a completely different experience of music if they sit on each side of this table, right? That means also that, that uh, music is like a probe on how our brains cognitively work. Because that means that we can actually study predictive processes by studying music. And you think about the latest theories about how the brain works, like, for instance, the primitive coding uh, theory uh, proposed by Carl Friston and other colleagues, uh, then the idea is that what the brain is doing is that it's trying to make sense of the world by looking at all. They, we get input and then it tries to make a sense of the world by, by seeing how well the input actually fits the model of predicting the future that it has. And if it does just fit, uh, fits the model, nothing happens. Then, because then we, can, we have a model and then we can free up our resources to go do other stuff. But if something happens 
where these guys say, oh, you have a completely wrong idea about how, the, how this model of the future is. Then our brains will have to go, oh, okay, is this dangerous for me, or is something I have to learn something about? So this is the whole idea about how we think about music. By the way, if you have any questions along the way, you feel free to, to ask. So, of course, what I was doing was what we can write very simply. Uh, it, it, it notate, or we can notate this as music, of course. Uh, it, it, it's easy to notate how to do, right? Uh, but the same thing actually happens if you think about this, uh, you know, this image, the Rubens uh, bars, where you can see either the, the bars in the middle, and, and then you don't see the faces, it's on the background, or you see the faces on the side, but you don't see both the things at the side. At the same, same time. Mm -hmm. And that's of course what the brain has to figure out is it has to make sense of, of music. Carl Fristen would say it would have to infer the hidden causes of the input. The hidden causes, there's a meaning to what you see or you, you hear, but it's not necessarily in the input. Okay, just to, uh, just a uh, very uh, uh, new study that we did. This actually shows you that if you have yeah, some listeners, then they will never, uh, even though you speed up the tempo, they will jump from from a one three four to the next three four just at, at, at a different level. That means actually that that uh, this this down here are the people who would prefer to hear this what you were listening to as a four four meter. This is a little bit simplified, but. But, but this is basically what we have been showing here. So this is also very interesting. Why do we prefer? Yeah. What, what, what is prefer? Mm -hmm. yeah. Prefer means that what, what if you are asked to tap to a, a point, you, it's easy. It's a, an easy study to do. What you do here is you actually ask them to to tap to to these uh, uh, um, uh, biasable rhythms. Like what we just were doing, and nobody would go to their team, right? Uh, so, 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 uh, so this is just to get the and 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 that means that that would be how they would uh, infer the meaning from this. You know? So this is uh, this is what uh, what the brain when you listen to a piece of music, the first thing the brain will start to figure out is what meter is it, and what uh, tonality. Now I don't have a piano here, but I could easily uh, tell you if you have a very da 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 da, for instance, you all know that song, and you all know that this is the tonality. But you might have been brought up in a culture where it was this tonality. Think of that. Suddenly it's a sad song, but because then you hear it as a man, so it's. Exactly the same thing in in uh, in uh, in, in uh, uh, melody and harmony. Just so, so, so it's just a, a rhythm is a very good good proof concept. And how does this actually work? And and this is this is what I also find is very interesting when you look at at this pre prediction that our brains have. And I should go here. I understand because of this sort of thing. This, but if you look at this prediction that the brain has here. Uh, then it's strong, weak, strong, weak. So this is our prediction if it's a 4 4 meter. But if you then go to the subdivisions, you actually have the same structure here strong, weak, strong, weak. And these are, of course, the, the 16th notes, which are below this. And if you go to the form, for instance, in a I got rhythm, I got rhythm. Uh, da, 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 da. The next one is weak. So the whole piece is strong, weak, strong, and then weak, because that makes you want to go back to the song. When you've been on the weak beat, you want to go back to the song. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so just to say that this is uh, what I was just was saying before that the meter is sort of one of the predictive uh, uh, models we have for predicting the future in our world, but we also have the same thing in tonality. And this was just a study that I did, uh, one, one of my PhD studies, or two of my PhD studies. This is where I had uh, people listening to, I don't even know whether it works, 
it's just fun to, to do. But I had people tapping along to a sting song, a small excerpt from a sting song called The Last of the Heart. And uh, this is uh, it's a wonderful, I, I, hope, I hope it actually works, I'm not sure. But, but then, uh, yeah, he even tries to listen to it. Uh, he did it for sorry. But it, it changes suddenly, I and mean, if you have to stay, stay on, on in, in the original meter, then uh, it's really hard. And what you can then see is that you have these different areas. Uh, the Brockman area 47, you know, this is part of the sort of Brockman area, which is the language area. It's not that this has something to do with language. It's just very interesting that you need these very high level uh, uh, brain areas as a brain in order to solve and this thing. This is usually used for syntax, uh, right? And syntax is also putting things in order. So, so this is basically how you could think about what the brain is doing when it's doing such a complex thing. And the interesting part is that if you have to produce the product, it's the exact same area that pops up in our uh, in our scans. Anyway, just to get back to the whole theory that I'm going to take you through today, everything is based on the critical coding of a music idea here. And just to, to say it again very slowly, is that if you have a, a model of predicting the future here in the brain. And then something comes in, which might be music, and the brain will calculate the probability that the model that it has for predicting the future fits uh, fits the given input. Right. Uh, so, and if it doesn't, this will lead to some kind of new uh, form of perception and over time learning, because then you need to have the new stuff into your model. Right. So. So that's the whole idea of our perception, uh, action, perception, action, and emotion and learning. We'll get back to that in, in just a short while. Uh, also, just to, to give you a, a, a small concept, which is also very important, is the precision weighting. Because the prediction error, the thing is that if something comes into the brain that doesn't fit your prediction, the idea from Carl Friston and colleagues is that you generate a prediction error, the mismatch between what is coming in and your predicted model, and that will be propagated throughout the, the brain in a cascade of different uh, uh, predictions and prediction, uh, prediction error in order to get a better model for predicting the future. This is one thing that you can do. That would mean that you would change your perception. You can also do another thing is you can act to resample the environment. That means that you say, okay, I have, I, I'm, not re, I'm not sampling this thing uh, correctly. I mean, that's why, that must be why I have the, this prediction level. So then you might, you, might, uh, you might act to look at it from a, a different side. And you think, just humor me here, if you think about this as music, what you do, if you have something that it doesn't fit, you might want to tap your foot, foot. I'll get back to that in a moment to act in order to actually resample some, some other stuff from the environment. So certainly your foot will give you the meter if, if you know they come in with your with their stupid uh, uh, walls over here, right? Then the these guys might want to do this. This is the right one. You've probably felt that tension when we were doing it before. So that's both perception and action in one model. Okay, so it's just to say that this, this is weighted by the uh, per, uh, Precision, because of course, uh, uh, and this will get back to that, is that if you have something where you don't have a very precise prediction, then your uh, your your prediction error, or the error, or the, the the emotion here might be felt quite differently, less strong. Okay, so the idea here is, and this is something that is a drawing that Warren and I actually made for our uh, big grant. Yeah, many years ago, I remember. Uh, uh, and the idea is here that you have something that doesn't fit the full formula, for instance. Do da 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 da. So we have some prediction here that doesn't fit. So you will uh, you will have this uh, this error correction mechanism in the brain, and that might lead you to tap the the correct uh, the correct sorry meter. Uh, meter, and that would, might lead to some kind of emotion, and over time it might lead to learning. 
So, okay. This is not uh, confined to music. So if you look, for instance, this is image. And uh, I was, this is one from the, uh, uh, the, the, the we have a, uh, in, in August, the city where, where I come from, we have this big uh, art museum where I saw this, uh, this picture by Ulf von Hansen. He's completely unknown. There is, I, I looked him up, uh, he Peter, and I, I think that he has two lines, and it says he has been, uh, he has been decorating a lot of hospitals. <laughs> and and uh, uh, apparently also the Ukrainian flag, but, but, <laughs> anyway, but that's, that's, that's it. But if you, if you look at this, what are you actually looking at here? Probably most of you are looking at these two annoying bumps on this straight line. Couldn't the guy draw a straight line? <laughs> and, and, and here becomes something very, very crucial for music also and art uh, uh, as a whole. Even though, because most of what we look at are straight lines, we we'll only see what the difference from the straight lines. Our prediction is that this is going to be a straight line. So this is what we want to look at, right? So, uh, so uh, what art does, and it is that it creates prediction error which cannot be, cannot be permanently minimized. Because the next time you look at this, you'll still be annoyed about these two, because still there are more straight lines in our environments than, than, than the other stuff, right? Exactly the same thing if you think about music. If I sing da, 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 then you have learned from experience and from your childhood that the next note is this one, right? So if I go da, 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 <laughs> don't matter how many times you are listening to this, your brains will still go, oh, that's wrong. Even though you know it's coming, and you, you've heard the same piece of music 200 <laughs> times. The brain will still go, oh, mm, something here that's not quite right. That's why we can listen to music 100 times. Really good music, well done music. It plays around with our predictions in a way that our, we cannot permanently minimize it. The next time around, we'll still have most. <laughs> and just to take you a slightly more well known thing, maybe also a little bit better. I also took this with my mobile camera, and this was in Milan, and just one week before COVID broke out, hell broke loose, we got home, and we and I got home from, from, from Milan, and uh, if you look at this, this is, this is of course the last supper by Leonardo da Vinci, and this is, it, it, it's just when you look at it, when you come in, I really would urge you to go look at it, uh, or see, it's so fantastic. And uh, well, this is a different thing, but if you look at this, what has he done? Well, he has made prediction error because he has this very, very nice line. You can see here you have an almost straight line, and here, of course, something happens here because you want to look at this one, but then you see this guy. And what is it actually? Uh, this is kind of the prediction error that you just see on the Ukrainian flag at the moment. Exactly the same kind of way to engage our brains through prediction. And just to tell you, this is this finger that is on the ground. So, let's go to uh, have a look at how can we actually measure this in the brain. And what I'm going to show you looks so simple when you see it, but it takes so long time to do. Anyway, this is what we have been spending a lot of time uh, looking at. A very simple uh, ERP component, which is called the mismatch negativity MMN. And that's an objective marker of auditory prediction error. And uh, for instance, if what, what you what you do is that you put electrodes on PSS or you scan them with a so-called MET scanner. This is an electroencephalograph, of course. You most of you will know what this is. You measure the small currents that are in the brains and you can you can look at the, uh, you, can, you get this kind of brain waves. When people talk about brain waves, they often talk about something else, but, uh, but this is basically, basically the waves that you get out of it. And what you can see is this is a diffraction uh, when you hear a de deviation from a pattern. And the most simple one is, for instance, if you go like this. So every 
this time, it changes your brain gets used to the pattern. It predicts, oh, it's going to continue like this. Every time you break it, you, you see this deflection on the uh, EEG, uh, like 110 to 250 million seconds after the deflection. So, this is, of course, a survival related mechanism because it's, of course, important if you think about the, uh, the, the people living in the rainforest. Long time ago, for instance, they would have to scan the, or the system would have to scan the environment and figure out what kind of, uh, what, what are the, what are the uh, patterns that are just normal and that I have to get used to, and when could it be dangerous to me. So, uh, so this is what happens. And now I was talking about precision weighting before, because one thing that of course also can be uh, studied by the mismatch activity is that here in the study by uh, the Simata Gavilo, uh, who did this with Kristen and colleagues. So what they did was they had a lot of sounds, uh, something like this. And then they had, would have these sound in a narrow band or a very wide band. And then they would place these kind of outliers. And if you place these outliers in a narrow band, you get a very strong mismatch negativity. This response to outliers or uh, deviations. If you put them in, into uh, a more broad band, you would have a smaller mismatch negativity. So that's just to say that this is the precision that you get, you have a less precise uh, prediction, and then you get small. This is negativity. And we did that, this, but in, in, a more, um, in a more musical uh, way. So we had, uh, we had these uh, uh, melodies with uh, low entropy, very simple. And then uh, so then we place some deviations, for instance, pitch deviation, do da do da, could be like that, uh, instead of do da do da, and uh, we place that then in uh, in we place a pitch, a slide where we go to bom ba bom ba, or an intensity where it was stronger, or a different sound, and what you see here is if you pay, place those in uh, this very uh, Predictable the context, then you get a large musical negativity, but only for pitch and slide, and that makes a lot of uh, sense because those are also the uh, the, the key uh, components of the actual melody or the context that you put them into. If it's the timbre, it doesn't matter whether it's an, another melody like this. Do 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 and so forth. So if you put it in, in this very uh, predictable uh, uh, context, you can actually see how uh, the precision weighting weight, uh, works. But important for this lecture is the rhythm deviation that Martin Marker did with, uh, with us. And what he has done here is that he has made completely isochronous rhythms. I don't know whether that is. So if you make it a more complex rhythm, then it suddenly becomes more difficult to hear uh, the deviations. And so this is what you can see down here, is that if you have a small deviation, then it would be almost not possible to hear if you have a, a more uh, complex rhythm. But if you have this very simple asynchronous, it's easy for the brain to, to hear, and then you get this last Christmas negativity. If you have a last deviation, it doesn't matter. Okay, so what does this have to do with groove? We'll come to that now. So why would we be interested in studying groove? Well, most of you know what groove is. It's something, something like this. this. Get to get to get to get to. That's what musicians would call a groove. It's basically drum, 
bass drum and maybe some guitar or a piano. And what is interesting is that, first of all, humans move to music. They move in time to music. And this is evident for every one of us, but animals, they just do it. They, I mean, there are some very few examples of animals that are able to be trained to do this. But most animals would have no idea. If you do it with apes or monkeys, they are so bad at doing this. They, they basically can't, if you just play doop, 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 and make them try to keep the rhythms like all of us would be able to do, they would be late all the time. <laughs> and because they are not really they're, they're, when, and it takes half a year to train them or something like that to do this, and they would always be late because they would be waiting for this and then they would go away. So this is not easy. Something that is uh, spe special for the human brain. Also, the human rhythm section, of course, uh, has the potential for communication. So, for instance, in Parkinson's uh, disease, most of you probably know what Parkinson's disease it is, and it's uh, uh, a bit difficult to see with Parkinson's uh, disease, and you have difficulties in moving, and you have difficulties in, in starting uh, starting to walk, for instance, and finishing walking. So they'll, they'll start to walk, but then they'll have a uh, difficulty not getting the wall. Right? So, and sometimes they freeze like this, and then you know for many years that you've never seen like this, and then they'll start to move again. It's, it's, it's almost magic. So, this is also something that I'm very interesting to try to understand. And it's relatively unique to human beings, as I said. So anyway, what would a group be? And I just took this, there are so many. Usually you think about James Brown when you think about groups, but I like to have a little bit of beats here. And this is a portrait of the beats, but it's this from McCartney uh, film. And yeah, you just listen to it and I'll, I'll tell you afterwards what, why it's moving. <laughs> But the, the, the song, which is also very loud when you hear it, will go, we start to the So you have these syncopations. And this is really, in all kinds of uh, dance music, this is a key component of what you are uh, uh, trying to, uh, to use for making people want to move. There's another, I, I can't, uh, there's another thing here that's also pretty interesting is that you have such a strong emphasis on intermediate beats. So that's also, just within the, the beat, there's also something that really wants to do. So, so, uh, so this is not, uh, see, it's not the only thing, but it's a very key component. And what, and what I did with uh, Maria Bicek, uh, our former PST and later postdoc uh, uh, was uh, to look at it. But what is it? How can we can we measure and can we see when people really think the simplification is, uh, is enough for us to want to move? And interestingly, if you if you take a rhythm and you make it more and more simplified from very little simplification like. To Yeah, you get 
Dave Lutz. This is more how you did, did how you did this uh, this study. And if you then ask people to do this with an internet study, then they there's this very, very uh, narrow band or sweet spot where you want to move and you feel pleasure. And uh, of course, if you think about this in particular terms, what, what you can see is as you uh, as we play these rhythms, your simplification go, uh, goes up, but your precision of uh, having the beat, of uh, knowing where the beat is, I guess you could feel that from what I was doing before, will go down, like you can see here, how, how it becomes uh, less and less precise. And if you actually just uh, Time these two uh, curves, you will get most of you can see this thing that uh, you so you can explain this directly by using the predictive code. And uh, of course, you can also say this is just what I think that it's going down. We have any evidence to support this, and of course, we did a most capture uh, a study where we played the, these the more sophisticated rhythms, and as you can see here, as your uh, as a simplification, a lot of your position uh, in, in moving to beat go, uh, goes down. And I did another study uh, with uh, Costas Karadotis uh, from, from England, where he's a sports scientist, where we try to teach people to dance. And what do you, what do you really need in order to make people uh, learn how to dance? You want you need the simplest movements possible. So, so even if it's much more fun to dance to sales as a roof, it's not good for learning. So, and these were professional dancers. So, if you then scan the brain, then this was our first uh, our first experiment where we used uh, these rhythms. What you can see here is uh, like more we would usually say uh, areas for motion and emotion, emotion, the old weeks that understood that to move and to be moved are part of the same system. Interestingly enough, I don't know if it's I about this, but of course, if you think about dopamine in the brain, then it's produced or synthesized in the brain uh, stem uh, in substantia nigra, which goes to the movements, and in uh, the system in the area, which goes to the, to the uh, reward system. So these things are pretty close in the brain. It just predicts in different directions, but there's a lot of spillover between the two things. So when you move, you actually get a little bit of reward, and if you uh, if you experience a lot of pleasure, you also move in a different way. Anyway, so <clears throat> so what happens if we add harmony? Because we were not completely satisfied with our stimulus, because uh, in a way it's not really music, so we wanted to make it a little bit more useful. We also wanted to get a bit of a bit of, a, a bit of our what can you say confounds uh, in the first step that we did because there were things that we hadn't absorbed. So we made some uh, study with some students uh, Thomas Matthews uh, that uh, came to us from from uh, from Montreal. He he uh, made this stimulus where the, for which he had composed a lot of different clave rhythms, so the rhythms would have exactly the same number of, of onsets, which was uh, confounded in the first study. And I made all these different uh, these different uh, harmonies, so that we put on top of, of these. I'll, I'll play to so so to, uh, so we had basically on two axes, which is always a good thing when you uh, when you do uh, psychological studies. You have a two, two by two or three by three uh, this time. So we had low, medium, and high rhythm, and low, medium, and high harmony. And I'll just play it to you. So I'll, I'll play the low, low. I'll, I will play all nine categories. But I'll play the low, low if it works. Okay. But in the middle, we have something that most people would 
would uh, probably prefer. <laughs> When you then look at what happens in the brain here, is first of all, you see some of these uh, elite generating uh, uh, areas in the basal ganglia, deep, uh, uh, deep brain structures in the cutaneum, the chordate, uh, which is also super close to, to the reward uh, system. And he also, uh, and also found some, uh, you know, some uh, areas in the medium always from the cortex here, which are part of the reward system. So again, you have both uh, for pleasure and the movement areas in the brain. But very interesting, if you then look at if you compare musicians to non-musicians, you can see that all these areas in the premolar areas, things that are sort of the things wanting to move, probably, because you're lying, you have to remember you're lying in a, in a, in a, in a brain scan, in a, MR scanner, you're not supposed to be moving. So these are three more areas, and you see those very uh, much more prominently in the musicians than the non musicians. That fits with other stuff that we also are doing that are not associated with us today. So, <clears throat> so this was a very exciting photo. And when we then did a mediation analysis, because we would like to find out what is the what are sort of the contributions from the pleasure and the wanting to move. And then you can see that the harmonic complexity, that works on our pleasure range. So in general, we just, if, if we like the harmonies, we get more pleasure. And through the pleasure range, it, 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 uh, it uh, works on our wanting to move. So that's probably why we have, we are not only playing at one case when we want to do the dancing laws on our base and we want to have some calls and so forth. But the really complexity works also, of course, on the pleasure range, but directly on our ones. This is actually a lot of things. But what then if you look at how many alone? And this was a slight side study that I, uh, uh, that I did. Uh, <clears throat> and, and if you look at how, how many complexity alone, you can see if you then put another one, uh, another, uh, and just an uptake, the low, medium, and high from before. And then you can see that from the system, they prefer the medium, the complex harmonies, but non musicians they are kind of equal from the low to the medium harmonies. So, uh, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Yes? In the Asian analysis, is that saying that, that, that there are some rhythms that make you move even if you don't like the rhythms? Yeah, it, it, I think you can say that what it says is that if you only have rhythm, you have a strong effect on one's move, whether, uh, I mean, regardless of, of the harmonic concept. But if you have harm harmonies alone, it won't, won't make you want to move. So, so uh, even though they are super funky, then the harmonies alone won't, uh, won't make you move. It works through pleasure. And uh, just to say, this, this is more technical thing, but we made this very, we have, uh, we have narrowed, originally we had 54 different uh, types of stimulus, six in each of the categories, we have narrowed it down to so just uh, nine stimuli, and we just use that if you want to do, to do these kinds of, of studies, because time is, is, is of the essence uh, in, when you do this, you don't want to spend too much time in the, in the scan. Uh, so we can just narrow it down to this. This was a yeah, stupid part of it. But it's, it's actually very popular, so it's not only in the But now comes the very interesting part, and it's completely new. And that is that uh, Richard uh, from uh, our center, what he has been doing is that he's been looking at Parkinson's patients. And uh, in Parkinson patients, of course, you have people, you can take them off their medication. Uh, they usually have some kind of agonist, uh, golden agonist, so that they won't have uh, so many symptoms. So, so what he did was he took the exact same uh, stimulus that we were looking at before, and then he, he used the young, uh, young people, age 22, 24, 26, something like that, uh, and um, 
And there you can see a very strong new new set of her. They really prefer the medium uh, rhythms, and they don't care at all about how many people listen. Doesn't matter. <laughs> just so just to, to elaborate on what you were asking before. So if you take the people who are then age matched to the partner matches, then you see a much flatter curve here. They still prefer the medium syncopation, but they also have uh, uh, preferences uh, as to the harmonic complexity. And if you then look at our uh, uh, patients, uh, the partners of patients, on medication they have slight, uh, slight uh, initiative curve, but it's not very strong. And if you take, take them off the medication, they only like completely regular rhythm. <laughs> Which is a really good, uh, just for this, uh, just without the brain, this is a very important thing because when you have all these different courses, uh, you know, you can go to salsa for partners and patients. Uh, tango for partners and patients is a very big in Denmark. And I think that might be a little bit too complex. You should at least take uh, salsa and, and, and uh, tango, which is, which is moderate uh, in the rhythm of this. What we were, of course, interested in understanding is what happens in the brain. Now, we wanted to, or this was Spiritus' idea, and this is a very, very good idea, that is to add an isogenous condition, because otherwise you, you won't be able to see difference in the new shape uh, between uh, people with heart uh, and, and, and healthy uh, controls. So the idea would, of course, be that for a completely isogenous rhythm, we hope that, that none of the uh, participants would like that, but that the partisan patients would prefer the low uh, sympathetic patients, and uh, the non partisan patients would prefer, or patients healthy consumers would prefer the medium sympathetic rhythms. Okay? And what did we get? We got exactly that. Partisan patients prefer. You can see here on the right, they prefer the low syncopations, and uh, healthy controls prefer the medium syncopated groups. Okay, what happens in the brain? And this is really exciting, and it hasn't, it's still, we have just uh, gotten these results, and I think they're super exciting. Think about the healthy controls. What you see here is a connectivity analysis, and uh, it's where, where, you, where you can do all the models with sensory model, model and reward system. Uh, in, in, the, in the analysis, and what you can see is that uh, for the isochronous rhythms, then you see only auditory system. But once you get low uh, uh, sin you see also the premolar areas of the SMA. Uh, and for medium, that's where you see the strongest connectivity in these uh, healthy controls, and you see this exact same thing with the uh, media uh, of the pre. Uh, the, the, the SMA here, and when you then get to the highly syncopated, it disappears again with the motor system or the, the premolar areas. But for the past patients, what you see here is, is that you see most of the connectivity from the low uh, rhythms, and when you then get to the higher end, you see uh, anti correlation. That means that if you play things that are too high correlated, then most the premolar system will just go all. I have no idea what's actually happening. So, <clears throat> that was the story about the, the group. But now I would like to take you to a completely new thing that we have just published the behavioral studies in scientific reports. And I will have to use you a little bit again. I will have to teach you a little bit of Danish. So, what you had to learn how to, you had to learn to say, you really fast. That's That means drum solo. So that's the point where you have to clap drum solo when you like this. I certainly had the. Uh, I won't say it. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, so, so, so now I, I wanted you to do it at the same time. So, okay, we start by saying Tongzong, and then we add the, the hat. 
So if you make people do this, it's impossible to have the meter, the, should you call it the taxes, the taxes in the mouth, and try to do it with the hands here, the rhythm with the hands. So taxes with the mouth and uh, rhythm with the hands, impossible. The other way is super easy. But now it's interesting if you do the same thing with the right and the left hand, then it's easy to have the taxes in the left hand and the rhythm in the right hand, but not vice versa. And the same thing with the left hand and the right foot, and then right foot in the left hand. Okay, just one, one before we go, uh, yeah. What if you're left-handed or right-handed? Then it's harder, uh, but then it's actually a little bit comp uh, more complex, but it will turn around. Okay. For most. But left-handers, we never, never use the left-handers. <laughs> the the brakes are straight. <laughs> you know, so, you know, if, if, because for instance, for right-handers, uh, every right-hander would have their uh, the primary uh, land stealers in the left part of the, the, or the left hemisphere, but for 15% of the left-handers, it's actually shifted, but not for all. So, so that's why in for competitive research, this kind of government, you don't you usually use left-handers. Of course, this could be an interesting question in itself, but hard to do. Anyway, just to say, good question though. Uh, but uh, but uh, just, just to then say that if you have, for instance, from uh, just one table message for this. So, rhythm here, taxes here. But rhythm here and taxes here. And rhythm here and taxes here. And you probably have, I, I, at least I, I know that when I started my PhD, it was a normal thing that, that people would say, okay, uh, uh, the left hand of the street don't need to survive. That's, that's sort of, most of I don't know how much data that is, but that's something that somebody must have, have done. This shows that this cannot be the case. Because the only one is, it, it depends on which, which kind of uh, effects you are actually using in your world. In your body to, to produce this thing. And that will also mean that for some things, the rhythm, for instance, if you have the rhythm in the left hand, that will be dominating. Uh, so the right hand should be dominating the left in this in this case. So just to say, this is very, very interesting. And this also means what we were experiencing when we did it, the first thing that was constituted was some kind of prediction error that needed to be done. That means that there are things biologically, or maybe learn, I don't know, but probably biologically, in our brains that creates some kind of prediction that we're not aware of. And this has big uh, consequences also for music pedagogy, or other kinds of pedagogy. And the interesting part here is that we started and we had 20, uh, 20 uh, participants in, in each group, 
non uh, musicians, amateur musicians, and musicians. But honestly, we would only have had to have two in each group because for everybody it's the same. It's not like it's a it's not like it's a statistic. We didn't have to, we were actually we had a hard time because we did we didn't know how to do statistics on stuff that, that didn't uh, have, had a very very there was no variation in the data at least not for the amount and the condition. But of course, if you make the rhythm more or less hard for musicians, it would be pretty easy if the rhythm is really easy. Yeah, but if you make the the the, the rhythm just a little bit harder, like what you just was doing here, yeah, it's still much harder uh, to do it in the uh, against the hierarchy in the musicians. So, and this is funny, funny though, because I remember when I was taught the piano uh, as a kid, we were taught taught to say, yeah, you had to count out off with your with your mom, one, two, three, four, and so forth. It's super hard. <laughs> and and I, I don't think that any piano teacher has ever ever thought about this. How hard that that is. That's, that's something that you should like to be trained separately if you want to do that. And this is of course not published yet, but what you can see here is again, if you want to go against the hierarchy, what you need to do is the SMA. This is where you where when you have to do something that is against uh, which, which it has to sort of resolve this. Uh, creation error by acting, then you need the, the SMA and the inferior constant virus that we also saw in our following studies. Probably also some English one is very close to the inferior constant virus. Just to give you a little, uh, because I have a little bit more I want to show. It's, it's not going to take long, but I'll give you a little bit of a break, bit of a break because I'll show a guy who can really, <laughs> could really do some stuff with, with this. His, his body. And, but the interesting part is he goes completely with, with our hierarchy. What we're going to see here is that he's going to, he's a rap, he's doing all this, all the sounds come from him now. So what he's doing is that he keeps the beat with his left hand, just straight, that's how, how it's supposed to be, and then he has a coin in his hand where he goes, so, so you can, he can use it. So he can use the snare drum and the bass drum with his hand like this. And then he wraps at the same time. Yeah. And now I I don't know an English speaker as you can post here, so I don't understand what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, don't listen to what if if you can actually understand what he's saying. <laughs> This is Brian Brown, of course. We were on the call. Now we're going to drop this old dumb shit like this right here. This is about doing like a movie with the cat jacks. And uh, this is our own big sack. Just take out this thing that happened. And we got a little bit of a chance with it. Rhythms and highest degree. 
So, and this uh, last thing, I think you can remember that. Anyway, the last thing I'll just show you very briefly here is, uh, is what we are uh, very interested uh, in, in the sense and the moment, of course, what proved this is something that, that, uh, that is uh, in line with what we think music is generally for, also evolutionary maybe, and that it's, it's, it's for bonding, um, for, for social bonding in different ways. I Many theories about this, I, this I'm not going to go as bad, but what we see in more hands then, when you try to bond the music, synchronize your movements. And uh, we have written about this in uh, the new, uh, in our new uh, paper in uh, Nature Reviews Neuroscience. Uh, and basically, the idea here is that when, if you think about, for instance, dancing, so, then if you are uh, from our first thing, where if you are on this side, if you think it's a march, and the one you're dancing with thinks it's a three, four, it comes out a little bit awkward. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, and if you play together, what you're all the time doing is trying to harmonize your your predictions. So, and that this is of course very like if you if you think about predictions like four for me and three for me, it's it's a very uh, crude way of, of looking at predictions. But there are many different things. And when I play jazz, for instance, with with my band, then we are always uh, thinking about uh, what is going to happen just in a little while. Because, for instance, if I play and the, uh, and the piano player for this bit, then I'm, I'm looking at where it's going. So that I know where to get in, right? Otherwise, I'll never uh, get to play some uh, other stuff than this thing. But this is basically, we are always trying to predict what the other people are doing. And often when we come out and listen to a for example, a piece of music being being recorded, then we'll go, okay, was that really what we were playing? Because you don't really listen to what you are playing, but with what is the possibilities and what they're playing. Anyway, so this is the basic idea about this, and you can of course, there are many different uh, predictions that you will be um, in terms of. But if you look into personal uh, synchronization, then uh, I'll, I'll spare you with this. But one thing that we have been mostly interested in was how do you actually track the other people's predictions? And this can be done very, very, in a very simple way. And one thing that we, there are different uh, theories about this, uh, but um, <clears throat> one thing that you can look at is the base oscillations in the brain, and I'll get back to that just in a short while. What we have been doing for many years is we have had these uh, things where we are fingers happen together. You put people, people in two different rooms, you put he headphones on their, uh, on their ears so they can hear what the other person is doing or not. I mean, you can manipulate these things, who is listening to whom, and so forth. But, uh, <clears throat> and then you, can, you, you simply look at the tacking. When you look at the tacking, you can see that most people do uh, this is what we call, um, uh, uh, they, they have become hyper-followers, so that they are adapting on an attack-to-attack basis to the other person. This is, they think they are keeping the tempo. The instruction is you have to keep the tempo and synchronize with the other person. So, even though they think they are tick, 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 what they're actually going is that they're going, if they're going a little bit fast on this one, then the other one is going a little bit slower, then they slow to the next step, and the other one would go a little bit faster, and then they would be oscillating like this. This is kind of strange, because this is not what, what you think you're doing. So this was Ivana Kondalinka's first study that we did many years, together uh, with Chris Frith and Elias Butthoff. Then we had this study that we did later, which was, we were thinking, okay, what then happens if you did people oxytocin? You know, a love drug, you know, there's a lot of things that should increase social bonding. And what happens if you give uh, people uh, oxytocin is that you can see that when they're tapping together, they're actually synchronizing better than they have they had oxytocin, but they, the, they, they are worse at keeping the tempo. So you can't use it for simple uh, uh, you, know, you, you would like to, <laughs> uh, but uh, but anyway, 
Uh, so, and what uh, uh, we then did with uh, Ole Asien uh, uh, was that uh, we think, but when, what happens if they start out with different predictive mo uh, models in their heads? So one people th uh, start out, uh, one person start out with a 4 4 meter, and the other uh, person is thinking it's a 3 4 meter, but they're tapping exactly the same thing. So one is having a polyrhythm, the other one is not, or they might be having, uh, or both be having uh, polyrhythms and so forth. So, so what actually happens, that is that if they have a different model, so in the beginning of the tapping, they are really not synchronizing at all. It takes some time to synchronize the models if you're not starting out at the right uh, part. It's actually what you see in, in this, uh, here, if you have a schematic, if one if person is thinking it's a 3 4, then they are, they are off in the beginning, then they harmonize it over time. Okay, and but which uh, are the synchron uh, uh, synchronization relationships? And they are basically first, Ivana's studies show that we had most of the person with this mutual adaptation where you do this. But other, uh, uh, in other uh, instances, you have a lead following. Uh, thing where one person was always tracking the other person, uh, and, and that's of course something to do probably with, with uh, personality and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but interestingly enough, in the old study, we also had very good musicians. And if you do that, then you find a certain, uh, certain population that would actually uh, both be leaders. So they start out and they'll say, okay, I don't care what the other guy is doing, others will be leaders. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I also don't think like that. <laughs> but, but the interesting part is they were all drummers. Not these two, which are, by the way, my uh, my drummer here in Sweden. He's very old now, so. But uh, but uh, and none of these are, of course, whom I would like to have in my band. <laughs> but uh, basically, they were all drummers. So drummers, what are they? Uh, what, what, what is their task in the band? The task is to. Disregard any kind of incoming information and just keep this tempo right. That's what you want to do. At least as a base baseline. And that was what they were uh, able to do. And they didn't drift so much that they were actually had to readjust uh, in those uh, 32 beats that they were doing. But what Morton uh, suggested was that we use a simple oscillator model to, uh, to, to uh, do at this relationship. And when you want to model this, and I won't get you into the math, but it's basically just a simple chromosome observation. It's very easy to understand. Uh, but it, it looks a little bit scary if you're not a mathematician down here. But basically what you can do is that you can use two oscillators in each person to, mod to, to model this tapping relationship between the two. One for perception, so you think there's an oscillator that is oscillated together with the other person, and there's an oscillator that is your own sort of action, what you want to, uh, uh, the way you want to, uh, to be tapping yourself. This is basically enough to model this very, very well, sorry, very well. And you can see that it actually, for most cases, fits extremely uh, well, as you can see from this curvier coefficient down here. If it's more than 80, it's, it's a very good fit. So you can, you can model both leading leading, use the adaptation, and then follow it. And if you then look at what happens with the ratings, you can also see that if you have, if you compare the mutual adaptations to the leading leading couples, then what you see is a network for perception and action, uh, action being. Uh, uh, being engaged in this mutual adapt, uh, adapters, which of course means that they will have to, you know, they have to sort of mediate between what's coming in and their own, uh, their own time. But and now I'm going to the last thing that has just been published, which uh, is a very very interesting study. Matthias also uh, also came to our. Uh, uh, our lab, I think his last name is also is uh, is respected on my part of the survey. But he came from him, this is Mark Levin's lab in Belgium, and what he he brought with him a very nice idea that we find 
uh, what he said was that what happens if we have two different uh, two different metronomes? So we have two people, but they are tapping a different metronomes and metronomes that are just slightly off. So if you think about it, it takes 32 uh, taps for you to, to from your complete synchronization until you're you're back where you started. So you, you have to think that they're exactly, but then they're drifting slightly apart and then they end up tapping uh, together. And uh, then you can copy them either visually, they can have them look at each other, even though they know that they have to tap to their own beat, or you can make them listen to the other person also. And what then happens is that if you have uh, a visual coupling, then uh, you can see that it actually the other uh, your your uh, taps actually become skewed so that you will follow if you get close to where they are in sync then it will be uh, influenced by the other person very clearly uh, whereas uh, over here there are no influence uh, influence from the other person so uh, but then you can look at the beta oscillations and the theory about beta oscillations is that if you for instance tap then the idea then is that you have this super fast, if you have a tap, it might be uh, two hertz or something like that, uh, 500 milliseconds uh, or 500 uh, milliseconds per beat. Uh, then, uh, then the idea is that you have a much faster oscillation, at least oscillations around 20, 20 hertz, that will go, uh, uh, in, that will actually be what you can see in, in the EG signal, that will go like this. Zzz, 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 so we have an underlying os os oscillation that is actually what, what drives this um, uh, your tapping. And uh, you can uh, do, uh, you can even extract this from your EEG. And when you do that, and you look at where you have a visual coupling, then you can see that in the brains of the, the person who's uh, watching, he has, of course, this. Uh, he has this uh, this piece of oscillation, but it's actually skewed a little bit, and you can also see that the piece of oscillation from the other tracking the other per person's piece is actually also uh, uh, in his brain. So you, in, in a way, this is probably a mechanism for tracking other people's beats as well as your own. And if you have the auditory, uh, if you have the auditory, you have a very strong. I, I, don't know why I didn't bring this. You have a, a very much stronger, exactly the same. Uh, here, but here you can see the, the beta oscillations underlying the other person being much stronger. Anyway, <clears throat> so uh, the conclusion is just that this uh, joint, uh, uh, this joint uh, finger tapping is really interesting, even though it's so super simple. It's really interesting in order to understand what, what makes us harmonize our predictions. And it's consistent with the mutual prediction theory that uh, proposes that each individual in the social transaction has brain mechanisms that control their own behavior and mechanisms that predict the behavior of the problem. And that might simply be beta uh, oscillation, or it can be at least uh, seen uh, uh, through the beta oscillations uh, as a marker. So this was more or less what I want to say to you, just to tell you that we have a course of our clinical researchers at the Center of Music and we're not only arts and patients, recovering plantains and so forth, autism and so forth. We're also very interested in what can this be used for, for, for instance, uh, when uh, for musical pedagogies, uh, I have been uh, talking uh, a little bit about this, but uh, this was a study done by Kristen Steenstrup, uh, which showed that you can combine physical practice and mental uh, chemistry, and then you get a better result and you get less injury, injuries for, for musicians. But also, Leonardo uh, was the main, uh, 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 the main researcher on this study, where he also showed that uh, there, there's a good effect of mental uh, practice. So, uh, just to say, read our uh, paper in the history of new science, it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> and these are some of the people who have been doing this work, that we are quite a number. This is an old, and this is before COVID. Uh, uh, there that was a couple, there were a couple of years where we couldn't make this kind of thing. And I just want to say thanks a lot for this.
He didn't know you. He didn't know that song is amazing. Yeah, I don't. This is very much, of course, been our dream for a while. Yeah, I think you know, our dreams sometimes come true. Um, so I think we'll take some questions. I will. I have the, the right to pose the first question. Um, so, in your view, why is it that music makes us flourish? And this is the question just you know, for Tuesday afternoon. Yeah, that's that's a long story. I think I think it is important to uh, realize that there are many there are universal reasons for it. Probably the way we we are we are done as a biological biological uh, human being. There are also cultural uh, things, and there are of course very big individual differences. I remember because when you're a musician, you you often think about music in a slightly different way. It's not necessarily the pleasure. I had many years where I, I thought that the pleasure of music was completely overrated. <laughs> I'm a little bit back to where I started, but, but uh, otherwise it would be hard to explain what we've been doing all this stuff. But uh, yeah, I, I think that 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 um, these three things are the things you would have to to sort of separate and look at. Uh, so when you're as a musician, when you then get that. Of course, it's true that a lot of musicians are so perfectionist that it's hard to actually get the kind of the get into the zone. But when you're in the zone, what do you think is happening in your brain? Yeah, and yeah, so, yeah. I mean, because of course, what happens when you show us the groove, right? And once you get into it, you start moving your body. When you get into that space, is that communication? Is that really what's going on there? Okay, that, there are different things you've been talking about here. Because there's this sensation when you have this out of your body experience and all the musicians have that it's really hard to get uh, it, it it's the, the idea that you i remember very vividly from a from jazz festival many years ago i was playing uh, and suddenly we were playing with our band and suddenly I, it, it was an electric bass that's why i'm doing this and suddenly i had this feeling okay it is we have it it's it's there you know that is what you, how you think about it and it's, you look at your fingers, and they're moving, and you think, I have nothing to do with it. this part of your body. People call it, oh, I don't, I'm not just repeating mm -hmm. that word, but it is a certain experience that is really, really uh, important and hard to. Uh, sorry, I can't do it. Oh, oh, yes, that's bad. Okay. Listen, that was different, so <laughs> I guess. Uh, so it's really hard to. But this specific. Um, mm -hmm. Specific uh, thing that, that all musicians know about that that is so hard to to try to do an experiment with that that we probably never understand. But I remember there was this, and this is completely anecdotal. There was uh, this uh, single topic that I uh, read in I think uh, Brain or something where they had uh, stimulated you know when they when they do uh, they do these studies with the two patients where they where they actually stimulate directly in the brain and you, they can you can make them move their fingers and their hands and so forth. And then they have stimulated at a specific place and it's oh, it's like I'm moving out of my body. It's really nice, he would we'd be saying. So I'm seeing myself from above. And then they took it away. Then they try to stimulate us. Like every time they got back to the same place, they would have had this kind of uh, kind of experience. So I think that might be there just might be something that is that is uh, in the brains. So, so when you talk about ego dissolution, right? you're talking about not being maybe I don't know. Your, yeah, is it similar to golf? I know you talk about it. No, it's definitely it's not. It's definitely yeah. not. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Somewhat similar, I think. It's it's. I I would I would really like to meet the person who could make the experiment on that. This of course is what we chain. Is that the case? I have no idea. I, 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 it's many years ago. I, I read that there's a PhD student now, so I was thinking, yeah, we won't get it there, but this might be something, there might be some an anomaly in our brains that can really do it. Of course, there are a lot of the reward uh, system uh, things that we, we know a lot about. This is, of course, it implicates this dopamine release and so forth. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, because you know, one of our students is doing this study on ayahuasca and music together. It would be interesting to see what we might get out of that. But I shouldn't be uh, one of anybody, anybody else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The question there. Uh, so you spoke about kind of 
predictions uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious about so, so and, and you also kind of said that, like, that other animals don't really groove, but I'm curious about, about so, so, so uh, I went to the old university and I worked with the uh, like, fishers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of yeah, I always said this. Yeah. We worked with those perceptions on how I think about air and so on. So, yeah. like, sometimes there's grooves around us in the world, mm. where sometimes grooves is about efficiency of movement. So, if I were to run, like if I if I have some limits with my right, 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 it's, 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 it's much more efficient for me to move in time, yeah. uh, as it were. And just like if you go to like a, a, a construction ground, so that's, that's, that's like a maybe like, like a hammer that's throwing <laughs> something into the ground. So sometimes you have machines like a cutting machine yeah. that will be making its own groove and it'll be sort of funky you know, because there's it would be super inefficient if it wasn't like happening in a certain regularity. Uh, which might mean that, that other animals could also like move with the groove, maybe they don't do it to see it out on purpose, but if they didn't, then they would be super inefficient. Like, so, so, so I, you probably, well, what do you think about other parts? So, certainly, like, prediction is one part of, of groove, but what do you think are like other components, such as like this, like, moving that we felt like this, which is moving in the fiction way, and then as a side effect that we, we like? There are lots of things you we know, think so this is a really interesting question. Uh, I think uh, as for efficiency, uh, the whole idea that music is one of the ways that people can actually interact in larger communities than you, we were supposed to be doing. This, this is part of the illusionary argument for music uh, all in all. And I think growth is a very important part of that because if you have music coming out of your loudspeakers or playing together and so forth, you can have much more people actually feeling, oh, we're on the same line, right? That's also what what what, what the Beatlemania is about, right? Oh, we feel we feel one, I'm not, or whatever, <laughs> this one path will be going, right? But we feel uh, we feel like one organism, right? So I think that, that that's part of it. But there are many other things that you can think about as uh, so let's go, go away from the brain. So we think about what, what music actually does. Uh, then one of the things that it's, it, it does is that it makes us feel like part of one group, but not as part of another group. So the in-group, uh, in out-group uh, idea. And, and, uh, and this is what you actually use music for. So you use music for, for saying, oh, we're part of the same group. So if you look at people who are listening to heavy metal, they're often also wearing little jackets and, you know, they're kind of part of the same, and this is very, this is, well, not what I mean, it's, it's a joke in a way. But, but you can say that, that what groove does is that it, it makes us operate on the same scale and it has social uh, implications that doesn't, necessarily has anything to do with the brain. Mm -hmm. Which is just to say, I have this emblem that I put on my on my coat and now I'm part of the of the group. Yeah, now I'm 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 at Oxford University, right? Not Oxford University, right? I we play this kind of music at Oxford University. So so this is I think one of the important things about group that we haven't touched upon here. But in, in just to say, if we go down to the, the more, what I'm interested in is that, for instance, now we have looked at syncopation. And it's super nice because we can model it with the time and that, and, and it's very strong, uh, it, it has a strong effect in all kinds of group music. But then this is my understanding. So if you go, so you delay your snare drum beat a little bit so it, Again, a prediction error, but in a different way of syncopation. But now it's actually supposed to be uh, hitting uh, the downbeat, but it might be a little bit too early or too late, right? And and uh, so the micro timing uh, is, is the next step where you would like to understand more what is in in the groove. This also goes to the, the grouping theory uh, that Daniels has been proposing. But but then there's the sound of the instrument. And I know that Justin, uh, Justin Donovan is just doing this together with people in Oslo at the moment, but they also and they group sounds like the clarinet from, uh, from uh, yeah, civilization, of course. 
this kind of sad funky sound. What what makes it a funky sound? I love when Paul McCartney is saying one, two, three, four. Like they, this is also super groovy. It's only the four beat, so it can also have room within the four beat. So all these questions are completely unanswered, and there are so many different angles you could take, take it. In. So if I'm not going to spend the rest of my life uh, researching groove, but but there's still uh, a lot of stuff that, that hasn't been explored yet. And also, what has the tube? Because this is something we're, that we're looking at at the moment. Because in order for groove to work, it has to be sound human. It's really hard, even though you, even if you make simple patients, if it's not possible to play for a long, then you're like, mm, not that groovy, right? Even though, because you know, there's some statistical learning that we used to, at least until 1981, we were used to hearing drum, uh, drummers actually playing the grooves. Then it changed, but it still is the basis that we 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 need groups to be playable. Now this is it's slightly different, but do you think that has to do with the body height? Body height? Probably, I think it has to do with with. Uh, I know this is not what what I, I mean, but but our ability with all the, the the action that we take in order to correct the the, the prediction that no. The, because if you can't act like, like if, you, if, if you can't take it in, it's harder to sort of correct the prediction error with your own body, I think. So, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm trying to be shorter in my head. <laughs> I really <laughs> love the talk. I mean, it's just yeah. fantastic if I predict it very easily. One thought that, was, that I'm really intrigued by, in, in, normally when there's a prediction error, <clears throat> there's some sort of can be something there's something novel. There's something like maybe um, we get it's just hormone release, like this is something you have to be careful here, something, something like that. Yeah. Now what's so interesting is this idea that as you increase the single patients, the pleasure went up until it became too complicated. Yeah. Um, and so why instead of fearfulness or attentiveness or arousal uh, you know, it's it's pleasurable. Why pleasure rather? You know, like that's so interesting. I think that's a very uh, the why I think uh, is simply that if we were only searching for security, we would not survive in the long run because we wouldn't, wouldn't be able to learn something new. You know this from of course sort of visual studies where if they give the monkey, they, they teach the monkey that they get some nice juice when, when, when the light is, they have lights and oh, then you get the, the, the one or the, the craving uh, for, for, for the juice, and then when you give them the juice, something yeah, happens because it has been conditioned to do that. And if you then give them the, some juice they don't, they, they, they don't expect, but they like, then it drops a little bit, then, then it goes, goes on again, so now you get actually to actually predict incorrectly, but you like what, what happens, then you actually get more dopamine. And that's of course because you want them to search, you want the monkey to, to search for stuff that is new, because it might be giving them even more dopamine. This is, this is like the, novel, the pleasure of novelty and yeah. learning something new. Or exactly. surprise. Or surprise. Or surprise. Yes. Yes. But I think Carpenter would be very strong on not calling what well, yeah, I'm talking about now for the same kind of prediction error that he's talking about. Because this is more related to not completely the same thing because, because the prediction error in Carpenter's formulas are strictly, they, they don't have a value, they're strictly uh, mathematical. So there's, there's, there's a side thing. Uh, but, but, but basically, I think this is what happens. You, of course, also know of the, these monkey studies. Where you where you cheat the monkeys, they have two different buttons that they can press, and seventy percent of the time, if they press this one, they get they get a reward, and only twenty five again. They learn this very quickly. But once in a while, they just go on the other side. It might have changed, right? So they'll always be curious for something new, and I think this is a very important uh, part. That's why that's why we need this kind of prediction in order to to so have a fulfill. I think the more we uh, call it uh, eudaimonia, probably. Yeah. Sense. So I think this is this is part of, of course, a very complex system in the brain, 
but that we make sure that we do different stuff so that we, in the end, survive it. And then, and then it's even more bizarre that, of course, we can listen to the same piece of music again and again and yeah. love it every time. Yeah. I try to explain that just uh, in the beginning, right? Just to clarify this is that if you think about the tone uh, of the, the authentic cadence, for instance, bum, 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 and 70% of the time in these uh, corpora that, that you use for doing this kind of studies, 70%, around 70%, I think it is. You will go like bum, 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 bum. So this is what you will be used to. But once in a while, bum, 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 bum. Okay, so every time this one comes, it will be surprising the brain because a statistical learning from very early on has told us that. But this is cultural, of course. This might be completely different in different cultures, but has shown us that. Each, so every time you listen to this, I can sing it again with bum, 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 bum. Now, it still does something in your brain that ah, it's kind of, it's, it's different, but it's kind of nice. Just like the monkey who gets the wrong tune for it. So, so, uh, so I, I can, and for that, music is a super pure yeah, way of, of, of continue the question playing the around the prediction yeah, so yeah. that it maximizes <laughs> the brain. Um, and um, for and that reason, about um, but if, like, Contrary to, for instance, the movie, yeah, when you watch it again, once, and yeah, once the it's just bad, and you never watch it again. But it's really good if you might want to see it one to test it. I think it's a lot of what it does. Then you probably will lose it. It's a pure style. That's a very good idea. I actually hadn't thought about that. I don't know if that's true, but it's not. Because you might have dancers who are actually more precise than they have to continue the question in the store. Nothing is nice. <laughs> <laughs> On the Ted Hadden Reddy art, which was like the out, and I didn't like the higher up, they had any dance. Yeah, but there's no difference between musicians and non musicians. Like, would, would you be interested to test it to see if there's a difference between dancers, or those who could categorize themselves as like have, having training in dance? That's a, that's, that's a very good idea. I actually haven't thought about that. That's a very good idea. Because you might have dancers who are actually more uh, uh, edge with their, their feet and their, their hands. So this, this is super nice. But well, even the people that you've tested already, like the, you could question them to see if they have any dance training. But, but you can also have dance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, I, 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 but, but for those, I think we have our data, as I said, there was no variance in our data. So, yeah. so, so that's how it is. Uh, but uh, one thing that was, uh, uh, I actually I lost the uh, was because of that, but I lost the uh, uh, the thread here. But uh, so we had done training, of, like uh, saying out loud one, two, yeah. three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. But they actually say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight for some reason. I never understood. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's that's that is true. So 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 that might be something so, so really interesting. Uh, one thing I just want to say is that some of our reviewers say, "Oh, it's just you know, it's just because uh, uh, the the task is easier uh, in the right hand, and it's, it's something with what was important wasn't the code." Right. Sorry, yeah, mm -hmm. so it's a thing. It's easier physically. It's that. easier physically. But just the thing is, nothing to do with that. Because we actually say it's, it's three against four. It's definitely not easy, even though, even though, uh, even though it's, it should be easier it's to be three than four. Right? So it's, it's, uh, uh, that's not the reason why there's some more deep, deep stuff to that. I think it has to do with bigger ground. I think everything we do. Is, is that we look at stuff in figure ground relations. If you look at the image, you probably see this as the figure, and this is a, uh, this is a figure, and this is the ground. Right? Uh, but at the same time, when you, for instance, hammer something, if you if you have to, you will use this as the ground to to hold this and this to hammer. So I think there's something with our the whole way our cognitive system works. One final question to Nellis, please. Yeah, very much in the same direction. Uh, uh, think about the hierarchy. First part of the question is why is the top of the hierarchy? Because think about the drummer. The drummer is leading in some way, you know? Yeah, always doing the most simple thing. 
So is it is it that the because it feels that the left leg is the most the one we use the least, so it's the one with less resources, yeah. so you put the same task, but is it following or is it leaving? Um, and also why do you think the symmetry exists? It really surprised me. Well, I think this why is symmetry, why it exists? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is, I think, as I said, I think the why is that we have a need for understanding the world, and therefore we understand the world in figure ground so that we know what to focus, that's something with attention. So I think that's a basic co cognitive concept that then also is implemented in the way we, we use our different uh, body parts. So I think that, that's a question. Uh, that, that would be my, my answer for that. But the answer for the other question is, there's a wonderful article by Chris Fritten and Andreas Wolfsburg with the title is what what is it at the top of the what is what is at the top of the top or something like that. That's, that's, that's the title. Of, of course it's if you if you think about the predictability theory, right, you think that something comes in, there's a very generic it gets uh, forwarded uh, and 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 it creates a prediction error at a, at a higher level, which creates a prediction error at a higher level. Well, where does it end? Is there, is, is, is there something, the, what is it called? The homunculus. Homunculus. Is there something that, that actually, where it stops? Where does the box stop? And uh, yeah, I think that, that idea is a little bit crazy, but, but funny is that this is actually uh, the, the, the top, top interaction. So it's, it's, it's something with a larger uh, network of people. Really, it's very, it's, it's very light. Mm -hmm. so, but that, that's, that's beyond my, um, I mean, as, as soon as we get to the consciousness and, uh, and this and that, so that, that's where my, my, uh, my interest stops. Well, you have given us a lot of thoughts. Thank you again. <laughs>